Uh, well, I grew up in uh, in New Hampshire, um, on the seacoast of New Hampshire, um, and I spent my 20s uh, as a musician in a rock band, a uh, songwriter and singer, and we did a lot of touring. Um, and, you know, I, I think for anyone who's done that kind of work before, you know, uh, most of your time is spent uh, traveling, reading, thinking, listening to music, you know, it's all, it's all the kind of the in-between spaces and um, did a lot of reading. Um, uh, but one of the things that I had uh, read was Joe Klein's biography of Woody Guthrie called Woody Guthrie, A Life. And, um, you know, that's where I encountered the work of uh, applied ethnomusicologists. Um, reading about the work that Lomax and others did um, for the Library of Congress um, was really kind of the first thing that I had run into. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's, that's a job. Somebody has that job. Um, that's an occupation. Um, how cool is that? And sort of the idea that there were people that were building public archives, the idea that there were people that were uh, recording the music and stories and everyday experiences of um, all kinds of people in this country was really compelling to me. Um, uh, so fast forward, I woke up um, around age of 30 and realized that, um, that trying to make a living from making music was um, starting to affect my love of it. And, um, and I really couldn't sustain it. And so uh, I decided that um, because I had heard about this thing called ethnomusicology, I decided um, to try to pursue that as a, as a career. And you know? so the idea that ethnomusicology was the study of people making music, um, the idea that this could maybe help me understand why I felt like it mattered so much um, led me to um, take, I feel like what was the most, um, scary step of this whole thing, which was to say out loud to my wife, um, Hey, there's, <laughs> there's this thing and it would involve going to graduate school for this degree in this thing called ethnomusicology. Um, and, uh, and she didn't laugh, um, you know, and that led me to, meet with different faculty members um, at ethnomusicology programs in New England where you know, I, I wanted to be um, in that region um, for family reasons. And uh, that led me to Jeff Todd Titan's door and, um, and Paul Osterlitz's door. They were both at Brown. Um, and they also didn't laugh at me. Um, you know, I wasn't somebody who ever intended to go to grad school. Um, and so for me, this was, this was a scary first step. And the idea that my ideas of music, vernacular music, why it mattered, um, what my observations were, the idea that that, um, was taken seriously and seen to have merit and that my career experience had merit, um, was amazing. I'm still amazed by it. Um, really, I, I feel um, incredibly fortunate to have met both Paul and Jeff when I did, and to have been welcomed into conversation with them the way that I was. You know, that didn't guarantee that I was going to get into Brown, um, uh, you know, and I was told as much. Um, but uh, I, I did, and um, that's where I went to school. Um, it was an MA PhD program. Um, and so I went there, uh, for, uh, five years. I think at the time I just felt really lucky to have found a particular set of, um, professors that found issues of music and identity, music and copyright, um, applied ethnomusicology. These were concepts that I, that like, um, I had some sort of, I had had encounters with, but I didn't have names for them in the way that ethnomusicologists have names for them. Um, and 
so it was a good, it was a really good fit for me um, because my idea of what an ethnomusicologist was, um, was initially was somebody from the public sector, you know, was an applied ethnomusicologist. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I had two realizations um, and this is gonna sound funny. Um, one uh, was, first of all, how incredibly lucky I was to, um, to be at, in an ethno program that, that um, encouraged uh, conversations and contemplations about careers in public service. Mm -hmm. um, the other was realizing actually that most ethnomusicologists um, uh, that I met um, or aspiring ethnomusicologists that I met wanted to be university professors. And um, <laughs> so, which, you know, in hindsight should have been perfectly obvious, but wasn't. Um, and so I was in a good place. I, I would say, I'll try to give you a couple of different examples as a as a person growing up, um, you know, I, I mentioned that I, I uh, was in a working band. Two of the guys in the band uh, were brothers. Uh, we were friends from uh, going back to elementary school. And uh, when we were in high school, uh, my friend's mom, uh, because we were musicians would drag us to these, um, Contra dances, and um, you know, we were kind of like we would roll our eyes and we'd be like, "Oh, geez, this is like a, a middle-aged divorcee's social scene." Um, and you know, we would just find our way to the arcade that was in the basement and um, and try to ditch the 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 dance. And um, years later. One of the things that I do at NEA is um, a part of our portfolio is the National Heritage Fellowships, which is the nation's highest honor in the folk and traditional arts. Um, one of the recipients uh, of that um, was Dudley Lofman, um, who uh, is a fiddler um, from New Hampshire and was one of the the square dance collars that would perform at these dances that my friend's mother would drag us to. And for me, you know, I, there's a part of me that wishes I could go back in a time machine and be like, man, I wish I had stayed at the, you know, like, why didn't I just immerse myself in this? Um, but it's also a reminder to me that the things that are most familiar to us um, in our everyday lived experience, um, you know, the things that make our communities most distinct um, also might, uh, on some level, um, go unnoticed by us. You know, we may make the assumption, anybody might make the, the assumption that, that this is nothing special or extraordinary. And uh, it seems so ordinary because we're used to it that we don't give it the attention that, um, that it warrants. I think the, the, um, there's some work that I that I do at the NEA that's related to um, uh, nation to nation engagement. Um, so uh, working with uh, with the nation's 567 federally recognized tribes, but um, really in my time at the National Endowment for the Arts and and visiting with um, Native nations. Um, individual native artists, cultural elders, um, that has been the most transformative experience for me. As an ethnomusicologist, there are elements, and as a public folklorist, there are elements of the work that are a reminder that um, occupationally, um, you know, my work in ethnomusicology, in public folklore, um, has a professional heritage that is um, intertwined with the government's uh, fraught relationship with Native peoples um, and its um, policies from 100 years ago of subjugation and assimilation. And, um, and so that's been a, 
a reckoning for me um, as an ethnomusicologist um, and in ways that are pretty dramatic um, for me. Uh, you know, so I've been fortunate enough to work with the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress in repatriating um, field recordings made by um, uh, by ethnomusicologists and folklorists um, of singers and musicians from uh, uh, the Oglala Lakota Nation um, as far back as 1890 or the 1890s um, and as recently as the 1950s. Um, to, kind of, to hear those recordings and to see those recordings returned uh, for purposes that were different from the reasons they were collected. <laughs> they were collected to just sort of be a reminder of what we were. Mm -hmm. um, and they are being utilized um, by communities to, um, to welcome ancestors home and to reawaken ancestral voices. Um, that is extraordinary. And I feel like it is incredibly important. Um, and I feel lucky to, to be a part of that kind of positive, uh, I hope healing change. Why does music seem to matter more now than it ever has? In the sense that, um, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50. Um, and if I compare music in everyday life in 2022 with music in everyday life in 1982, when I was a kid, um, it exists everywhere. It's, it's the, the presence of recorded sound in our everyday lives is ubiquitous. And, um, and, and yet it's value like in some ways people value it more than, than they ever have. They want it as their constant companion. They want it to be this, their walking soundtrack as they, as they wander around with earbuds or drive in their car or um, exercise or go to sleep or meditate or whatever it might be. Um, and at the same time, it has the, the currency that's, you know, the, 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 the value maybe that music makers have within society um, seems to be lower than ever. <laughs> um, maybe I have a skewed perspective on that. Um, I think ethnomusicologists have an important role to play in that discussion. Ethnomusicology being the study of people making music makes this a human-centered experience. You know, it's easy to hear music as the sound of machines. It's easy to hear music as something delivered through machines. But music is ultimately something that is organized and shared uh, by people. It is something that has meaning because of people, um, whether they are the makers or the listeners. Um, we're all makers of meaning. And ethnomusicologists play an important role or should play an important role in helping to foreground that. Um, helping to make sure that our conversations about, I don't know, anything ranging from Spotify to um, noise pollution to whatever, you know, that, that we are being mindful and conscious of uh, the people involved, the humanity of the thing. Um, that's, <laughs> that's how I feel this work is important. <laughs> 